to you. Job chapter 1. I'm going to read one verse. And it'll be verse number 7. He said, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And that's what I want to preach on. And Satan came also. Uh, you know, we're in a world, even a church world, that is oblivious to the fact that there is a true living, breathing devil. Right. And he's going to do to you what he tried to do to Job. Yeah. Right. He is not for you. Right. He is a liar, right. a thief, yeah. and a robber. Yeah. And he will destroy your family just right. like he did try to destroy Job's family. Yeah. We're living in a world where people are medicating people thinking that that is their problem. They need medicine. And some people do. Yeah. Not all people need medication. Right. Some of them need a good dose of salvation. Yeah. That that would cure and get rid of the devil that's living in them. Yeah. Now, let me say something about him coming also. He comes and he's not invited to this right. pro program here. Right. Right. He's come, he'll come here every service. Sure he will. He'll come, none of us wants him here, but he comes anyway. Right. And what is he going to do? He's going to interrupt the service. He's going to make our pastor stumble around and try to f figure out how the service should go. The reason I know that I've been there and I know that he'll do everything he can. There's people that need help from God and right. you know what the devil will do? He'll invite himself here to destroy our services. Right. He'll, he'll, just, he'll, he'll invite himself here to get you discouraged and say, well, you know what? I, I'm this or I'm not that or I, I don't fit in. I want to tell you something, friend. You are as important to this church as the fellow sitting on the other side of the building. Right. But the devil, first of all, he has invited himself here. Yeah. Now, let me say another thing that he did in verse number 9. He instructs God about his servant. Yeah. You know what he's doing? He's telling people, he's telling God, Christian, about you. He knows you better than your father God does. No, he he does not. He does not know you. Right. Right. You know what he said? He said, if he said, if you'll take everything he has, he'll cuss you right to your face. I want to try to tell you something tonight. The devil wants to instruct God on what kind of person you are. The Bible even tells us he's an accuser of the brethren, right. but he is not the one who has authority over you. Right. He'll cause you to lose sleep. He'll cause he'll cause you know, stress is yes. killing America. Yes, sir. Stress is killing us. You know why? Because he makes us wonder and ponder if God, how could God who loves us so much that he would send his son to Calvary and die for you, fail to stay with a God who said in his word, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. He instructs God. Verse 10, he comes to increase pressure. You say, it can't get no worse than this. Oh yeah, it can. I've been Brother Doug in my life where I said, it can't get no worse than this. And it does. You know what the devil's going to do? He's going to increase. I've never seen so much pressure in all my life. Right. Everywhere you turn, this is a complicated world we're living in. Right. You, I, I'm, I'm telling you, you almost have to have a PhD to order a hamburger at McDonald's. All these stupid gadgets they got. Right. We're living in a day of computers, and all it does is slow us down. Right. They say money, money causes problems. But if you've got cards, and I've, I've never stepped in a line behind nobody had cash that caused problems, but it's these guys with these stupid cards that says, oh, there's money on this. No, there ain't no money there. There's money. No. I'm going to tell you, he's in cranks and pressure every day. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Let me say this. He comes in verse 12 with the intentions mm -hmm. to destroy yeah, right. Job. Yeah. Yeah. You children, listen to me. I've lived long enough to understand one thing. The devil has nothing good to offer you. The music he has to offer is not good for you. The people he has to offer you is not good for you. The lifestyle he has is not good for you. The people that he tries to put in charge of your life, even in our school system, even in churches, you know what he's doing? He has intentions on everybody in here to destroy your life. 
From the youngest to the eldest. You know what the devil wants to do? He's going to invite himself and when he's done, he, I heard a preacher say one time, the devil will take a little, he'll take a little, but he will not stop until he takes it all. Right. He will not be happy until he destroys everybody right. in your family. Right. And we have to be on guard every day Amen. to make sure Amen. that he don't destroy our lives. Amen. Satan, you go to work tomorrow, he'll be there. You get in your car tonight, he'll be there. You go home, he'll be there. And he'll be there uninvited. So I just say to you, you're going to have to pray up. Amen. I'm done preaching. That's good, brother. Isaiah chapter number 28. While you're turning there, let me give you a brief summary of the couple of chapters before this. Isaiah has just prophesied about the end times. Christ coming back to set up his reign to set things right. Then at the beginning of chapter number 28, for the first four verses, Isaiah is given a prophecy against the people at uh, Ephraim. Yeah. Ephraim was a tribe, one of the descendants of Joseph, that were given their own tribe in the lineage of Israel. They were adopted, so to speak. But then they turned their back on God. And you don't find them listed in the 12 tribes of Israel when you get to the book of Revelation where 12,000 is going to be saved out of. And the picture that's given in the first four verses that they're prideful, that they set up their own reasons to be magnified among men rather than magnifying God who deserves to be praised. But, verse number five, this is talking to Judah. It says, In that day shall the Lord of hosts be a crown for glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people. In other words, God's going to make a day where he will be the one that you, you are glorified through and glorified in. In verse number 6, For a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment, and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. Now when it says, In a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment, to put that in other words, if you judge according to what God says, God will make that judgment come to fruition in your life. God does not see the righteous forsaken. God doesn't see those that do right suffer wrong for doing the right thing. Okay, that's not, you know, God has rules. You reap what you sow. God will not allow you to reap wicked for putting good seed into the ground. Okay, there will always be a reward for doing the right thing. He will become the judgment because you have judged your own actions according to what thus saith the Lord. But it's the latter part of this verse that caught my attention. It says, and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. That's an odd phrase. Yeah. To turn the battle to the gate. Because see, normally in a battle, one of two things has happened. Either you're being attacked or you're attacking somebody else. Right. If you're being attacked, you're on the wall. Right. If you are the one that's attacking, you're already attacking their gate. So what's this verse talking about? Well, you can look, you can go over to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 18, and I also believe 1 Kings 18. There are two examples of how when Israel was attacked and faced by the enemy, that instead of just defending, they went on the offensive. And they chased them all the way back to the gates of the attacker's city. They turned the battle from where they thought they were going to fight and they took the battle to the enemy. They didn't stop when the enemy broke down and turned and ran. No, they chased them all the way back to where they came from. They didn't stop until they went into their city and said, we don't want to mess with God's people anymore. We're sorry that we came out of our city in the first place. But what it says to people like that, that God will be their strength. And as I read that, you think... You know, Christians nowadays have the mindset that we have to be strong. No. I said it this morning in Sunday school. God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. God's not looking for the strongest. God's looking for servants. And we see a lot of Christians that believe they don't have the spiritual strength to make a difference in this world. My question is, have you tried turning the battle to the enemy? Because God promised that he would be the strength of those that turn the battle where to the gate. Yeah. Yeah. I know that there's a fight here. 
But if the devil keeps you fighting on the wall, you're not down making a difference off of the wall. Good. If you're defending and taking all of your refuge in that God will protect us, God will protect his church. Right. It's impossible for the gates of hell to prevail against the church of the living God. Right. But if you lack strength, if you feel like spiritually you're weak, try going out there and driving the enemy out. Try facing, not relying on your own strength, but relying upon the strength of God. Because he promised that if you take a stand, if you purpose to drive them out, it said that he would be your strength. That his strength would be manifest. Why? Because you're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for the name and the cause of Christ. Now I just quoted that verse, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God. Didn't we just hear that the devil likes to show up places he's not invited. He's got minions that will show. Have you tried running them off with the word of God? Have you tried turning them back to the gates that can't stop the church of God? You know what that means? You can open those gates. You can go past those gates and make a difference. But you've got to be willing to turn the battle from where you live to where you can make a difference. That's where the strength of the Lord is made manifest. Look at people that God empowered throughout the Bible. Samson. David. Right? So many people. What did they have? They had nothing. But they were purposed to take the fight to the enemies of God. Not to let the enemies defile what God has said was holy and worth protecting. And it was because of the boldness in their heart that God strengthened them. Because they were purposed to put one foot in front of the other, knowing that they may very well meet their end. And God honored their faithfulness and their cause. And because of that, he gave them the strength to prevail. That's it. It's a very familiar portion of Scripture. God showed me some here that I uh, had never actually seen before. Amen. And it's almost like His Word is a living Word. Hey. A Word that we can glean from every day of our life and still get something new from it. Hey. We're going to be starting in verse 11. And He said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. In verse number 12, we see that a portion is given. The father gave the younger son the portion that fell to him, which by Jewish law, technically nothing should have fallen to him because he was not the eldest son. But the, the father was still gracious to his son and gave him a portion. In verse 13, we see the preparation of the son. It said he gathered all together. It means the son had put some thought into this. He had made a plan of what he was going to do, where he was going to go, and how he was going to do it. In verses 14 through 19, we see that he is pining for sustenance and home. He's in a far country that is very different to him. He doesn't, he doesn't know where he's at. He's not comfortable. He's hungry and he's alone. In verses 20 through 24, we see the passion of the father. When he comes home... The father saw him from a long way off. And he ran up and he kissed him and fell on him. Brought the best ring, killed the fatty calf. And they began to be merry. That's what the Bible says. But the text verse is going to be verse 13. And it says, And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. What I want to preach on for the next couple of minutes is on your way to the far country. On your way to the far country, there's a reason that you're going to the far country. There are rivals that will subtly lead you farther away. In the Old Testament, I'm reminded of Amnon. He had a friend named Jonadab. Jonadab was a very subtle man. Led him to do very evil and wicked things. Those five words. And Amnon had a friend. Who are you surrounding yourself with? There will be ruts that you will fall into. Yes, sir. Your relationship with the Lord will slowly fade to the point of complete indifference on right. your way to the far country. Right. The casual rhythm you will fall into will be spiritually deadly. Yeah. Brother Adrian preached on the 
casualness in Christianity, yeah. Yeah. which is very good. Thank you. I appreciate that. It helped me to get things right. showed me this, actually. And the casual rhythm you'll fall into will be spiritually deadly, and the ruthlessness of the devil will keep you there. Right. Right. When your convictions become a convenience, mm. you may be on your way to the far country. Yeah. Mm. When your get-tos become have-tos, you may be on your way to the wow. far country. Yeah. But there is a way to come back. In verse 17, it said he came to himself. Yeah. Something jolted him out of his autopilot reality. Yeah. Something Good. stopped him from going any further. Something Good. stopped him from going through the motions. Yeah. What reality have you settled into? Mm. Whenever you find your sufficiency in something other than Christ, you will begin to fall. You may be good at something for a while. You may keep yourself for a while, but eventually you will fall. Right? Yeah. If you find your sufficiency in Christ, the second you start fighting, you start losing. I've learned to let Christ fight my battles because I can't fight them by myself. Yeah. But with Christ, we can turn them to the gate. Right. And Isaiah 41, 13 says, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying yeah. unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Yeah. Be careful if you think you stand. You may just be sinking. Right. Love the Lord, serve Him, hold nothing back, stay the course, because today might be the day your prayers are finally answered. Yeah. Amen. But don't fall and keep yourself from going to the far country. Oh, yeah. Good. John chapter number 3, as you're turning there, I want to thank the pastor for allowing us to preach tonight. And I also want to thank the Lord that I have a Bible that's alive. That when I read a very familiar scripture, one that the whole world knows, that God can still show you something new out of it. John chapter number 3 and verse number 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Two questions by way of introduction I'll ask you this, uh, this evening. Is there anybody here that would to think of the, the best person that you can think of? Whoever you might put up on that pedestal that even though they may not deserve it, that you just think that highly of, that you're willing to give one of your children for their sins. If you would do that, I'm not preaching to you tonight, you can go back and get your cup of coffee. Now think about the worst sinner that you could think of, and obviously the answer to that is like, no, we're not going to. But yet that's what God did. God sent His best for each and every one of us here. God sent his absolute best from heaven to die on the cross knowing how we would fail him on a daily basis. He sent his best for us. So what I want to preach on with this thought of mine, you cost God too much. You cost God too much for him not to care about you. The Bible tells us casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. You might think, hey, I had a bad day today. I had a bad day, uh, whatever. Life isn't fair. I don't like what life's thrown at me. You don't think God cares? You don't think he's right there, knows what you're going through. You don't think he's right there to help pick you up with whatever it is that you may be faced with. God still cares. No matter how uh, troublesome you may find the world, God still cares. Can I say not only that, you cost God too much for him not to love us. The Bible tells us in 1 John 4, 19, we love him. Not because we have nothing else to do, but because he first loved us. As we, would, we could say that when we were unlovable, but as Brother Bob would tell us, we were never unlovable to him. He always loved us. In our worst condition, he still loves us. I've told him at the jail before, you can walk out of here this morning at jail and you can say a lot of things, but the one thing you cannot say when you walk out of here is nobody loves you and nobody cares for you because God does. No matter where you're at, what you've done, God cares for you and God loves you. Not only we've cost him too much for those, but we've cost him too much for him not to protect us. Right. It doesn't say we won't go through the fire. Right. What did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They were in the fire. But when King Nebuchadnezzar looked in there, what did he see? He said, I see the fourth man. Because the Lord was in there with him. He, he will always be there for us. I, I think of uh, Brother Bobby Cato. He's the first person I ever heard talk about this and say this. So there might have been others. But we know in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 5, the end of that verse, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. A verse so good, it means the same thing backwards as it does forward. Thee forsake nor thee leave, never will I. He is always there to protect us. You cost him too much for him not to protect you whatever you're going through through today. No matter what Satan may throw at you, no matter what the fact that Satan you might feel like is set down in your lap, he still loves us and cares about us too much. Amen. And say this lastly. You cost God too much to take him for granted. We heard her talked about a little bit already this morning. We heard her talked about a little bit tonight. How much do we take him for granted? 
We go out and get in our car. I've asked this. We, we go out and we get in our car to go to work and we just automatically, we don't even give it a second thought that our car is supposed to start. We just take for granted it's going to start. We show up here on Sunday morning, just take it for granted our pastor is going to have something for us. We just show up on a Sunday night, on a Wednesday night, just take it for granted our pastor is going to have something for us. We think of our, our, our spouses, our kids, or whatever it may be, the things in life that we take for granted. How much do we take God for granted that we just expect Him to show up? How much time do we truly spend with Him and realize we cost Him everything? Do you think He don't care? You think He don't love you? But yet, we take Him for granted. We, we, he talked about, you know, Crescent Springs. I've been over there and preached quite a few times. That could be us in a heartbeat. You think, no way. Sure, I, I've heard pastor talk about churches splitting over the color of trash cans. You know, we have no idea. But yet we take him for granted. He costs, we cost him way too much to continually take him for granted with all the blessings that we've been given. The title of my message is When Jesus is in the House. Amen. And, um... It's in Matthew chapter 8, uh, verse 14 and 15. The, um, the thing about it is, this is a sight of Peter. You're not used to seeing. You're going into his house. You don't go in people's houses. This is the first time I've seen this. I mean, I've seen it before. I've read it. I've heard preachers preach over it. But you're going into someone's house. It tells them, tells you what they're like. Yeah. Everything about them is in the house. Yeah. From paying bills, paint, yeah. but I'm sure Peter didn't live in a triple crown type atmosphere. No. He did not live in an influential, affluential, well, whatever that word is, <laughs> place, but he had Jesus. Yeah. He had Jesus there. Yeah. But anyway, verse 14, 15. When Jesus... And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, we saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. Verse 15, And he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. Peter lived in Capernaum. He left Bethsaida. I believe I'm saying that right. Andrew lived with Peter. Peter's was married because it talks about he had a wife. So that's telling me he's a family man. Right. He had his mother-in-law. He was a good guy. He was a good family man. Yeah. There's a lot into that because what it's telling you, he cares about family. Mm. Jesus, I mean, Peter didn't have a clue that Jesus, I don't think, it doesn't say nothing about it, he had a clue that Jesus was going to show up in his house that day. He did not have a clue. But the thing about it is, Peter's mother-in-law was sick. And that was laying on Peter. Peter had the disciple. He had to go follow Jesus. But in his mindset, he had his, his wife's mother on his mind. He was thinking, oh, bless her heart, uh, because she was in bed. She was sick. And Peter had to deal with discipleship, and plus he had to deal with his mother-in-law. And then that's a trial. And his wife was going through the same thing. But Jesus. But Jesus showed up. That's when I said, Jesus in the house, I seen that. That's the time Jesus showed up big time. I said, glory to God, that's awesome, man. Yeah. And Jesus, when he come into Peter's house, this is, I'm, I'm skipping a lot of my points, but when, on my third point on verse 14, when Jesus came into Peter's house, Peter's house was welcomed. See, they welcomed Jesus. The whole demeanor was different there. A lot of people don't welcome Jesus. That's right. But the whole point of this is, when Jesus shows up, that's when they get the blessing. I honestly think when they all were in, in one accord, I guess, if you will, that's when Jesus touched that dear mother-in-law of Peter's. In verse 15, he touched her hand, and, he, and the fever left her. And when he touched her hand, you know, it's something that they just, the thing about it is, that same hand that touched this dear lady 
It's the same hand that touched you. Yeah, yeah. Like that. Yeah. It's the same hand that touched the leper. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same hand that touches everyone that's in the scripture. Yeah. It's that same person. Yeah. And see why? See how crazy we are? Yeah. Yeah. Because we got full of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And you know darn well when um, his mother in law got touched, you know they had a good time down there at Peter's house, and, there's, and then his neighbors are thinking, Good night in the morning, son. What are they doing down there? Every night they're yelling, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I mean, what a way, what a way to go. But, the, but, but it, at the very end, she arose, and the fever left her. She didn't have to have no counseling. She was all well. And she was healed immediately. That's how salvation works. It's immediately. It's not a three to four or five month course on down the road. You'll get saved about six months from now. It's immediately. It's yeah. spontaneous. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. And ye have been quickened. Yeah. Wow. Who are dead in trespasses and sins. Yeah. And all it takes is that touch. Yeah. Amen. That's it, Pastor. The Bible says in James chapter 4 and verse 8, Draw nigh to God, and He'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 19, it also says this, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. I'm going to give you an illustration of something. You have to understand where I'm from to give this illustration. I've been in uh, John Paul Jones Arena several times watching a basketball game. That's at the University of Virginia. We'll you. I pray, thank you. Uh, and that, that, uh, that arena holds 14,000 people. And anytime I went, I sat in the section that is affectionately called the nosebleeds, nosebleed section yeah. or the cheap seats. Yeah. Uh, you're way up, way high. Now, I'm there. I'm experiencing the game but I'm not experiencing it like those that are closer. Right, right. The ones that are down on the court. Yeah. The ones, quite frankly, that paid the price to be there. Yeah. I want us to think about tonight, Good. are you living in the cheap seats? Yeah. Wow. Good. If you are, this is going to be something that's going to happen. Now, I'm not talking about where you sit in church. I'm not talking about that the people that sit on the back row are not right. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about where you sit in your heart. Yeah. Yeah. If you're sitting in the cheap seats, there are more distractions. Yeah, true. True. You are looking at me, and I'm what you see. But somebody back there sees all kinds of things going on back here. Right. Right. You see, there's all kinds of distractions when you're further away from God. Right. Yeah. And the one that's close up is, is focused on what's happening because they're close in their heart. There are more things between you and God to distract you and to sidetrack you if you're sitting in your heart in the cheap seats. If you're in the cheap seats, it'll cost you less. If you don't put in much in, you're not going to get much out. Matter of fact, you're not expecting much, are you? If you're sitting in the cheap seats. We've talked about putting skin in the game in, in Christ for the Caribbean. If you're in the cheap seats, you don't have much invested. Right. And by the way, you're not going to accomplish very much either. Right. Right. If your heart's in the cheap seats, if, you're, if your heart's in the cheap seats, you have no intimacy. You see, I married Nancy to be with her, right. not to good. be apart from her, good. not to be at a distance from her. Good. Now, God, God's called me here and God's called me to, to be honest with you, to travel more than I've ever traveled in my life. Now, I believe I should be doing that. But I want you to know, when God's through with me in that place, I'm ready to get home. I want to be close to the one that I married, that I love. This is my wife. And if you want to be uh, continuing in the cheap seats... You're kind of saying you really don't love the Lord like you should. And, and there's, there's just something there. There's just no intimacy. You know, John didn't leave, live in the cheap seats. 
Matter of fact, he was the only one that laid his head on the bosom of Jesus. He's the only one that heard the heartbeat of God. Nobody else did. Now, there were some that were closer, and there were some that were further apart. He's the only one that was at courtside. Right. Yes. Good. He's the only one. And as a result of that, what did he do? You say, well, how did he reward him? You take care of my mother. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. And some might say, well, that's no big deal. Yeah, well. Boy, you don't love your mother. If we're in the cheap seats, we can't hear the still small voice of God. Mm. Mercy. Amen. Mercy. Yeah, right. If I'm talking, you can't hear me if you're way off. Right. Yeah. And sometimes we can't hear what God's saying because we're, we're in our hearts, we're living in the cheap seats. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. In the cheap seats, you can't see things clearly. Right. You know, I, I've, I've sat up there and I've looked down and I could barely make out the number on the jerseys. Right. You're so far away. Right. You know. and, and then every once in a while you could tell they did something right. You know, they had a good player. And sometimes you even, you heard people applaud and you didn't know why. Yeah, right. <laughs> You're so far away. Right. Oh, but if I was at courtside, yeah. you know, I could, I, I'd have been right there to, and could clearly see what was going on. You see, things are kind of fuzzy when you're a long ways off. It's hard to make out exactly what's going on. You can't see the details. And by the way, it's easier to misunderstand what's taking place if you're living in the cheap seats. Oh, I wonder why the preacher's doing that. Well, get close and find out. Why are we going in that direction? Get close enough to find out. In the cheap seats, you don't know what's going on. You're too far away. In the cheap seats, your companionship is shallow. You know, there's some people that just prefer to be in the cheap seats. Right. 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 They really don't want any responsibility. Right. They don't want too much expected of them. Right. And so, uh, and by the way, if you get a little excited, they don't want you to sit in the cheap seats either. <laughs> yeah. right. They don't want you to be there. Right. You make them look bad. Right. You make them feel bad. Uh, and if you're not careful, their coldness can rub off on you yeah. Amen. if you're in the cheap seats. You might become content with being there. You'll also find more of the enemy the further you get away. I noticed this when I would go to the UVA games. If we were, whoever we were playing, uh, I went to see them play Louisville, for example. It just happened. But I noticed that up in the cheap seats, I saw some Louisville jerseys. I didn't see any at courtside. The enemy was closer. The opposition was closer to the cheap seats section. And you're going to find out you're going to be the ones that are in the cheap seats are going to say, but this and but that. Yeah. And maybe this isn't the thing, and, may, and maybe the preacher's losing it or whatever it might be. You're going to hear stuff like that. In the cheap seats, there's not much responsibility. Right. And let me add, there's not much reward either. Right. Right. About all you do from the cheap seats is go home after the game. You come, you stay, you go home. That's the, way you, that's the way church is from the cheap seats. You know you have the responsibility, you ought to be there. And by the way, if you're in the arena, you're already saved. But you can be saved and live in the cheap seats. Because if the Bible says draw nigh to God, that's an invitation from God for His people. Right. So his people can be in the cheap seats and keep that distance away. I hope that we don't get caught up in being comfortable in the cheap seats. Our desire should be to get as close to the action of the court as possible so that we can be far more participators than we are spectators. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.